NFL Week 5 waiver wire video. So if you are someone that plays fantasy football and you're more interested in the waiver wire additions aspect of this video, feel free to check out the timestamps and jump ahead to that part. Now, as for the Week 4 recap, if you're here for that, then please just stay right where you are. We're about to get into that right now. Uh, full disclosure, I did try and record this video once previously, and I think I bobbled my head a little too much. Something happened between the frames and the audio. It was just irrecoverable. I couldn't get the audio to match up with the video, and I think it's due to lighting. It's an issue that's happened a couple times in the past. I've never able to pinpoint when it's going to happen or what exactly is wrong, but usually it's too much motion and lighting, so I've, you know, stabilized that light behind me so that it doesn't move. It doesn't change colors. I'm going to try and be more stationary in this one. I, instead of standing, I'm sitting. I think that I move back and forth a little too much while standing. And then, uh, yeah, in terms of audio, I've, I've realized that the people I live with are way too loud, so I'm piping in some ocean sounds in the background through the same thing that uh, emits the light. So hopefully, I don't know if you're going to be able to hear it, but hopefully you don't hear as much background noise. All that aside, let us get into this past week's slate. First up on Thursday Night Football, we had a matchup between the Dallas Cowboys and the New York Giants. This game, uh, I unfortunately was not able to predict correctly. I went bold once again on Thursday night, uh, selecting the Giants to win this matchup. Once again, wrong. That marks three straight weeks that I'm wrong on Thursday night, but that's okay. Uh, the Dallas Cowboys end up taking this one 20-15. Our key contributors on the Cowboys side of the ball, Dak Prescott, 22 of 27 for 221 yards and two touchdowns. You got Rico Dowdle with 11 carries for 46 yards. And finally, C.D. Lamb with seven catches for 98 yards and a touchdown. On the Giants side, you've got Daniel Jones with 29 of 40 passing, 281 yards, and an interception. Finally, you've got, sorry, not finally, but furthermore, you have Devin Singletary with 14 carries for 24 yards. And then Malik Neighbors with yet another impressive day, 12 catches for 115 yards before exiting the game with a concussion. Now, rather than going through all the team stats, as I mentioned, I recorded this video once before. I've selected a few key statistics that I wanted to point out, uh, so I'll give you one to maybe two key stats uh, for each team in their matchups. So first up, we've got the Giants. Uh, the biggest takeaway for the Giants in this game is their 26 yards rushing total. This is a Dallas team that allowed 270 plus rushing yards to the Ravens in the loss the week before. So for the New York Giants to go out there and only get 26 yards, one shout out to the Cowboys defense and Dan Quinn for figuring that out. Uh, you know, obviously they assessed what was wrong. They tried their best to handle it and they did a fantastic job of making sure New York had no run game at all. Now, if you're New York, I think you have to evaluate the talent in your running back room, as well as why could you not run on this defense? 14 carries for 24 yards is abysmal if you're Devin Singletary, not good at all. Uh, truly, the reason why the Giants lost this one, in my opinion. And then, on the Cowboys side of the ball, you won this game by 5 points, but really should have been a lot more. You're trying your best to give this game away, in my opinion. Uh, Cowboys penalized 11 times for a total of 89 yards lost in this matchup. Easily could have had a more productive day on offense, better defense, um, and all those stoppages. It did make the game a little harder to watch, uh, so the Cowboys they end up winning and it did go down to the fourth quarter, but the Giants were not really on the brink of comeback like that, as I was hoping for. So, uh, Cowboys moved to 2-2, two and two, Giants fall to 1-3 and three at the bottom of the AFC, NFC East. Next up on Sunday, we had a matchup between the Bengals and the Panthers. Uh, Bengals end up winning against the Panthers 34-24, to picking up their first victory on the year. Both teams moved to 1-3. and three. You have Joe Burrow going 22 of 31, 232 yards passing, two touchdowns.
touchdowns and one interception. Then Chase Brown, 15 carries for 80 yards and two touchdowns out uh, carrying. I don't know how carrying, but out gaining Zach Moss in this game. And then finally, Jamar Chase, three catches for 85 yards and a touchdown. Uh, biggest highlight was his touchdown grab where he broke a couple tackles and broke loose for maybe like 65 yards, something like that. Then you've got Andy Dalton putting up almost an identical stat line to Joe Burrow in the loss. 25 of 40 passing for 220 yards, two touchdowns, and an interception. Chubb Hubbard with 18 carries for 104 yards and a score. And then finally, Deontay Johnson, another impressive game. Seven catches for 83 yards and a touchdown. Now in this game, we had uh, the Bengals key stack being zero sacks allowed to Joe Burrow. I know that a big priority this offseason was the fact that they needed to protect Joe Burrow in the years where he's gone down. They have not been competitors when he is around their competitors, so that was their biggest priority. Uh, I think Trent Brown was just announced to be done for the year, so we'll have to see if that affects anything, but so far, uh, zero sacks allowed you want to see that as many weeks as possible. Great job to the Bengals there. And then for the Panthers, honestly, valiant effort. Only ended up losing by 10. I know that the gap was a little bit larger in the third quarter, but uh, could have been worse. It still looked like a very competent offense. Uh, you scored multiple touchdowns. Biggest flaw, I would say, is going one of three on fourth down. Uh, the two drives lost to the fourth down conversions. That ended up being the difference in this one. But, hey, uh, compared to where you guys looked two weeks ago, three weeks ago, this is a huge improvement. I'm not going to be uh, overly critical on the Panthers' performance here. Next up, we've got a matchup between the Saints and the Falcons. Uh, this is another one that I unfortunately got wrong. The Saints end up falling to the Falcons in the final seconds of this matchup. The Falcons win 26-24 final score. Both teams at 2-2 two two in this NFC South. Got Derek Carr going 28 of 36 for 239 and an interception. Alvin Kamara with 19 carries for 77 yards and a score. And finally Chris Olave, 8 catches, 87 yards. For the Falcons, you've got Kirk Cousins, 21 of 35, 238, one interception. Tyler Algier, once again outgaining Bijan Robinson, eight carries for a whopping 60 yards. And then finally, Drake London, six catches for 64 yards. I was watching the end of this game. I had the Saints winning it, and I was really, really rooting for that comeback attempt. They had the ball late in the game, could not quite get it into touchdown territory. They were down a good amount. They needed the touchdown. Had to kick it off to the Falcons. Falcons couldn't do anything. Saints get the ball back. Not too many timeouts, but they drive the ball down the field. Time is expiring. They get the game leading score uh, to go up in the game. So there's a little under a minute left. I don't think that the Falcons have any timeouts. Maybe they have one at most. And so all the Saints have to do is play a little defense and maybe they'll be able to win this game. Come in an egregious uh, pass interference on Ray Ray McLeod, putting the Falcons one yard outside of field goal range. I don't know if they ever picked up that final yard, but they sent out Young Wei Koo. He nails the 58 yarder. They win 26-24. Uh, yeah, it, it was, I mean, great for the Falcons, uh, honestly. 58-yard game winner, it's got to be one heck of a feeling. They played pretty well um, in terms of key stats. Let's take a look. Uh, Saints, you lose the turnover battle 2-1 to, to one in this one. That's pretty big in a two-point loss. You're going to be looking back at those turnovers, obviously. And then finally... Falcons, 4 of 11 on third down. I think the Falcons offense as a whole, not that bad. Uh, decently efficient, I think, over 6 yards per play. But 4 of 11 on, on third down, I do think that is something that you can improve overall. I'm sure everyone is happy with the end result. That's really the only thing I would adjust. 
Uh, and I get another prediction incorrect. And this one, uh, I'm gonna, I don't know, I guess it's a backhanded compliment for the Broncos, the key stat, 60 yards passing. Like, bro, what? How do you get 60 yards passing in a win? <laughs> um, back in a compliment because, like, shout out the defense. You know, you really didn't need offensive production like that from Bonix and company. Uh, you, you did it. You held New York to three field goals, and that was all. Uh, but, jeez, 60 yards passing in a win. I think the only time I've seen fewer passing yards is when Mac Jones was limited to like four passing attempts in that really windy game against the Bills. Then uh, on the other side, for the Jets, there's a lot of things I could point out. Uh, the thing that I chose to highlight, I suppose, is Brees Hall, four yards on ten carries. That's not good. That is not good at all, my god. How do you have more carries than you have yards? Ten carries for four yards. Uh, Astounding, astounding inefficiency. Richard White aims to be this level of inefficient. How have you outdone him? Uh, and, you know, I could also bring up the missed field goal. I could also bring up the, like, 13 penalties for 90 yards lost. All around, horrible day for the Jets. They look like they're last year, so I think it's because Zach Wilson was in the building. I don't know what it is about that guy, but he makes this team look like trash in their general vicinity he has some sort of effect on them so they they didn't look good at all after after looking really good last week they looked horrible this week i guess we expect them to bounce back maybe and for the broncos you you won back to back weeks like you're actually in the midst of not a lot of bad teams not an impressive week but defense looks sharp Alright, so my loudest roommate just came back and his voice loves to just travel wherever in this apartment. So we'll see if we can hopefully pipe in enough noise to avoid hearing him. But let's talk about the Vikings and the Packers game. The Vikings and the Packers combining for 60 points in this matchup. A pretty big scoring affair, but kind of misleading. It actually was not that close of a game at all. Packers exceptionally good at putting up garbage time stats in this one, uh, giving it the illusion of a close game. I suppose, like, maybe the Vikings were tense in their final drive, but heading into the fourth quarter, you've got the Vikings up 28-7, to then a 22-point fourth quarter by the Packers. Almost did it, but not quite. Um, Vikings end up winning with a final score of 31 to 29. In this game, you have Sam Darnold going 20 of 28 for 275, three touchdowns, one interception. Aaron Jones, 22 carries for 93 yards, and Justin Jefferson, six catches for 85 yards and a score. Then on the backer side, you've got Jordan Love, 32 of 54. Uh, 389 yards, four touchdowns, but also three interceptions. Then Josh Jacobs, nine carries for 51 yards. And Jane Reed, seven catches, 139 yards, one touchdown. Looking at the key statistics for this game, we will find that Sam Darnold had three touchdowns at halftime. Uh, that's going to be pretty good in helping you win games. Sam Darnold early early leader early in the mix for mvp uh, words i didn't think i would ever say before but he has the most passing touchdowns of any quarterback has a couple interceptions in there too but he has been very good uh vikings one of the few undefeated teams left in this league they look great uh, and then for the packers going to be the fact that you lost the turnover battle four to three now obviously three is a lot by the other team as well but there's no way you're going to be winning games losing four turnovers it's just not feasible uh jordan love coming back from injury showing that he can still have a good game uh, on that knee that is good 
everything that they deal in the game, I'm happy with it, just because confidence boosting and chemistry building, all that, I'm glad that he had the day that he had, but, um, three interceptions, he was shaking off the rust for sure, uh, not ideal. Next up, we've got a matchup between the Steelers and the Colts. Uh, this is yet another one that I got just barely wrong. Uh, we have the Pittsburgh Steelers falling to the Colts in the final. Well, I guess it wasn't in the final, uh, but they fall 24-27 to the Colts. Colts without Anthony Richardson for part of the game. I think he went down in like the second quarter. Uh, Justin Fields goes 22 of 34 for 312 yards and a score. He also has 10 carries for 55 yards and two touchdowns. Really put the team on his back in this one. Also got George Pickens with seven catches for 113 yards. As for the Colts, you've got Joe Flacco leading the way with 16 of 26 passing, 168 yards and two touchdowns. Jonathan Taylor with 21 carries for 88 yards and a score. And finally, Michael Pittman Jr., six catches for 113 yards. Uh, this one was also pretty close. You had the Steelers down like 10 for a lot of the second half, but they mounted a decent comeback effort, and they were pretty close to field goal range. I want to say like 20 yards away, but just a couple bad throws and a couple like broken up plays by the Colts defense and they weren't able to do it. I was really hoping that they could die the game because I didn't want to be wrong in so many of the early slate, but uh, the Colts just did, did a good job. And in the key stats for this one, we have the fact that the Steelers lost the turnover battle, uh, losing turnover battle two to zero. Yeah, it's gonna be costly. Only end up losing by three points. Justin Fields does his best to erase the mistakes. Um, and not necessarily his mistakes, but, you know, make up for these turnovers, but just couldn't get it all on his own. And then, uh, the fact that the Colts and, you know, Anthony Richardson out for this game, you don't like to see that, but no turnovers is something that you like to see, so the Colts limiting the turnovers in this one and getting another win might be some correlation there if Anthony Richardson is ready to go for the next week hopefully he is able to you know just do the same not turn the ball over <laughs> next up we got a matchup between the bear, the Rams and the Bears the Rams walk away from this one with their heads down losing to the Bears Bears win with the final score of 24 to 18 uh, kind of unexpected got this one wrong as well got Matthew Stafford going 20 of 29 224 yards and an interception Kyron Williams has 19 carries for 94 yards and a touchdown and then Tutu Atwell leading the way with four catches for 82 yards for the Bears you've got Caleb Williams 17 of 23 yards 17 of 23 passing 157 yards and a score then DeAndre Swift 16 carries for 93 yards and a touchdown and then DeAndre Swift also leader of the receiving game seven catches for 72 yards in this one uh for the Rams I think I highlighted their their turnover differential as well they lost a turnover battle to Chicago uh two to zero which yeah if you're if you're turning the ball over more than Chicago it's gonna be hard to win they had the ball late in the game. It was it was gearing up to a comeback attempt. You know, Rams with maybe like a, a minute and change deep in their own territory. Gonna have to drive the ball 90, maybe 90 plus yards uh, to try and win it with a game-winning touchdown. Field goal's not gonna cut it. And on like the second play of that drive, Matthew Stafford throws an interception, so it doesn't even matter. It, is over. So, poor comeback attempt. I really thought that they could do it. I didn't want to be wrong on this one either, so I was hoping that the Rams would be able to do something, but uh, yeah, I just had to roll with the bunches here for, for 
with pears, I could highlight a couple things. The one that I'm going to highlight is uh, Caleb Williams, zero turnovers. I think that is really the biggest positive uh, in this game, the fact that he did not turn the ball over. Uh, yeah, phenomenal, phenomenal job by him. Obviously not as impressive a passing day, but he did have a much higher completion percentage going 17 of 23, and yeah, no, no picks, no pick sixes. That is huge. That's what you want to see. That's the development I'm looking for. And then, honorable mention, you've got DeAndre Swift, you know, finally making an appearance in this offense. He has a great day, great, great day, really the leader of the offense in this one. And yeah, Chicago moves to two and two. Rams fall to one and three. So after that, we've got uh, the final matchup from the Sunday morning slate. It's the Eagles and the Bucks. Another one I got horribly wrong. Probably one of my worst. It's the Tampa Bay Buccaneers getting the best of the Eagles. Final score: thirty-three to sixteen. Jalen Hurts was not good in this one, 18 of 30 for 158 yards and a score, but I think he also was responsible for two fumbles, if I'm not mistaken. Saquon Barkley, eight car sorry, 10 carries for 84 yards, and Dallas Goddard once again leading the receivers with seven catches for 62 yards. Baker Mayfield, 30 of 47 passing for 347 yards and two touchdowns. You got Bucky Irving with 10 carries for 49 yards and a score. And finally, Mike Evans with 8 catches for 94 yards and a touchdown. Uh, in this one, yeah, Eagles losing two fumbles. That really was the backbreaker here. Uh, anytime that you had something going, kind of just fumbled it away. No pun intended. Uh, and, and then for the Buccaneers, you had 445 yards of offense. Like, I, I didn't really know what to highlight, just everything was pretty positive. Lots of offense, uh, that's a lot of yardage. Uh, you've got to be quite happy with yourselves. Almost 350 yards passing, you got over 100 yards rushing. Uh, great day, taking down a pretty competitive team in the East. Or sorry, yeah, in the East, but in the NFC as a well. whole. So yeah, after that, we move into the Sunday afternoon slate, starting off with the Patriots versus the San Francisco 49ers. Not a particularly close one here in Santa Clara. You've got the 49ers winning this one 30 to 13. I unfortunately watched this game, uh, would not recommend it. You have Jacoby Brissett, 19 of 32 for 168 one touchdown and one interception. Uh, that interception being a very costly one to put San Francisco up seven more points. It was a big six. Uh, Patriots did a great job of limiting San Francisco to just field goals on their first two offensive possessions. That was huge. And then Jacoby Brissett throws a big six to put them up. Uh, so, what was the point? <laughs> then you've got Ramondre Stevenson, ineffective day 13 for 43 yards, and then Antonio Gibson as the leading receiver, three catches for 67 yards. For the 49ers, they get back some of their weapons. George Kittle plays in this game, Debo Samuel plays in this game. You've got Brock Purdy going 15 of 27 for 288, one touchdown and one interception. A oh, magnificent catch by Jabril Peppers on that interception. Uh, and then you've got Jordan Mason, 24 carries for 123 and a touchdown. And finally, Juwan Jennings still leading this wide receiver room. Three catches for 88 yards. In terms of key stats, we've got the Patriots allowing six sacks in this game. Once again, turnstile offensive line is not going to do it here. Anyone you put down there, uh, whether it be Jacoby Brissett or Drake May, they're just gonna get bodied, buried alive. I would love to see Jacoby Brissett continue to be quarterback for this team because I don't want Drake May to get eaten alive like that. He's not ready for that. Uh, get the get the whole line working and functional. And then for the 49ers, I'm going with a bit of a critique. 
uh, the fact that you won the turnover battle at a margin of two to three, uh, I don't think that's good enough. Turning the ball over twice, not really something that you want to be doing. Obviously, the Patriots outdid you, so it didn't matter. But really, this beatdown could have been a lot better. And I think you know it, I know it, we all know it. Forty Niners not playing their best football yet, even with a big victory here. They they still have things that they can improve on. Next up, we're gonna go with the uh, other matchup of the afternoon slate. This is the Commanders and the Cardinals. Once again, the prediction I got incorrect. Commanders absolutely rolling the Cardinals with a final score of 42 to 14. Uh, Jaden Daniels playing a fantastic game once again. 26 of 30 for 233 yards, one touchdown, and one interception, but really not that bad. Uh, Brian Robinson Jr. with 21 carries for 101 yards and a touchdown. Uh, no Austin Eckler in this game. And then finally, in the receiving game, Olamide Zacchaeus, uh, six catches for 85 yards. On the Cardinals side, you've got Kyler Murray. 16 of 22 for 142 and a score. Uh, James Conner goes 18 carries, 104 yards, and a touchdown. Finally, Marvin Harrison Jr., 5 catches for 45 yards and a touchdown. Now, in terms of key stats, it's hard to say something for the Commanders because they're just so amazingly impressive at the moment. I foolishly picked against them in this game. I don't know why I did that. I think I have fully learned my lesson. It's just, commanders are great at offense. They have done it. Uh, they had 11 straight drives that were scoring drives at one point. That was broken up by the interception drive, but they kept going in the second half of this game. They actually got better as the game progressed. Seven points, then 10 points, then 10 points, and then finally 15 points in the last quarter. So. Uh, commanders are absolutely rolling on the offensive side of the ball. The thing I chose to highlight was the over 200 yards rushing. Uh, and that coming off of the legs of Brian Robinson Jr., uh, Jeremy Nichols, who is filling in for Austin Eckler, and Jaden Daniels himself. Just uh, 200 yards rushing. That is an impressive stat. And then for the Cardinals, four penalties, only four penalties, which is good. But 82 yards lost, uh, that is crazy. How are you losing that many yards on your four penalties? Kind of egregious, obviously. There's a lot of things you could choose to focus on when you lose by this much. But I think committing less blatant and bad penalties will be helpful. Uh, if you had four penalties for like 28 yards lost, that's a lot less impactful. Because uh, I think that like yardage lost by penalties is pretty bad, um, pretty frustrating. And yeah, I don't know. And I could also talk about Kyler Murray only passing for 142 yards. I think that's pretty bad. Uh, need to pass the ball a little more than that if you're gonna want to win. Ideally, unless you're rushing for a lot, but they didn't do that either, really. Next up, you've got the Chiefs and the Chargers. Chiefs pretty banged up after this game. Rishi Rice going to IR most likely. Uh, it seems like he has a torn ACL. Uh, Patrick Mahomes threw an interception, then accidentally decked Rishi Rice's leg, hyperextending it, and now he's going to be out probably the whole season. Uh, Chiefs winning 17-10, but the Chargers did get the early lead. They led 10-0 after the first quarter, and then they were shut out for the rest of the game. Mahomes goes 19 of 29 for 245, one touchdown and one interception. Then you've got Kareem Hunt, 14 carries for 69 yards. And finally, Travis Kelsey, welcome back to the land of the living. Seven catches for 89 yards. Justin Herbert on the other side of things, 16 of 27 passing, 479 yards, one touchdown. J.K. Dobbins, not very effective today, 14 carries for 32 yards, and then Ladd McConkey, 5 catches for 67 yards and a score. In this one, uh, things that I chose to point out, uh, the Chiefs, you won this game, but you lost the turnover battle 2-0. 
that's not okay. Uh, Patrick Mahomes throwing a lot of interceptions this year. Gonna wanna stop that. Will be hard considering how limited his talent pool is at wide receiver at the moment. You know, Hollywood Brown already announced out for the rest of the year. Rishi Rice now gonna be out. He was the focal point of the offense. Travis Kelsey woke up in this game. Hopefully he can stay up. But you really only have like Savior Worthy and then the rest of the receiving group is even worse than last year. Uh, so that's kind of a problem. And then, sorry about that. Uh, you have the Chargers. Only 224 yards of offense. That's not going to cut it. You need more than that. Uh, and then you're getting shut out after the first quarter. What's going on, guys? You, you are a run first team. 225 yards. I think you only like got like 50 something yards. Obviously, Chiefs defense, you can credit them, but if you're going to be a rushing team, you got to rush for a little more than that. Justin Herbert, if he's not throwing for 300, then uh, you're going to have to have an impressive running game. So, yeah, that's that. Alright, after that, we just have four games left. So, first up, let's talk about the Browns and the Raiders. This was a an okay game. I had it playing. I had the entire afternoon sleep playing at the same time. Uh, in this one, you have the Raiders ultimately taking it from the Browns with a final score of 20 to 16. Once again, a game that I predicted incorrectly. Uh, in this game, you have Deshaun Watson going 24 of 32 for 176 yards, one touchdown, and one interception. Jerome Ford, 10 carries for 58 yards, and Jerry Judy with 6 catches for 72 yards. On the Raiders side of things, we have 14 of 24 passing from Gardner Minshew with 130 yards to go with that. Uh, Alexander Madison, very efficient, 5 carries, 60 yards. And finally, Jacoby Myers with 5 catches for 49 yards. In this one, uh, what I chose to highlight for the key statistics for the Browns uh, was 170 yards passing. You had 176 yards passing, but if you account for the sack yardage lost, that's 149 yards passing. That is not enough. Deshaun Watson, you are making $250 million. There's no way you can get away with throwing less than 200 passing yards. If I am the Browns, I'm expecting 250 a week. If we get 200, less than 200, and it's a win, I guess it's okay. But bro, it's just not good enough as a passer right now to be making his contract. It is the biggest, you know, money hole in the NFL. This is the worst contract in the NFL by far. Uh, he did have a pretty impressive throw that was called back by penalty. Uh, to Amari Cooper, which would have gone all the way for a touchdown, and plays like that I like, but in terms of Deshaun Watson's attitude, I think last week he announced that he wants no part in design runs for the Browns, like, bro, they signed you to $250 million, do what you're told, like, there's no reason to be this diva, they literally made the playoffs with Joe Flacco last year, and now you, you, as the quarterback of the team, are one in three. Like, have some dignity. Have some accountability. Take on or Like, don't be... I don't know. I, I really... Truly just despicable behavior by Deshaun Watson. Both on the field and off the field. Uh, really not liking his on-field attitude. And for the Raiders, a uh, key stat here being 152 yards rushing. Uh, pretty good, pretty good. Maybe not as much as some of the other teams that will be mentioned in this week, but 152 yards rushing is something to pat on yourselves on the back. Uh, crazily enough, it was Alexander Madison with his very low carries, very high production, who led this group, but uh, very much a group effort to get all those yards, with Samir White coming in second by not too much. So yeah, good job on that front. Raiders move to 2-2, two and two, Browns fall to 1-3. and three. Finally, we move into the Sunday night game. This is finally one that I got right. Uh, after so many 
mishaps on a Sunday. This kind of selfish my week uh, made me feel not as bad. We've got the Baltimore Ravens smacking the Buffalo Bills in a game that I predicted. Uh, we've got 35-10 being the final score in favor of the Ravens. Obviously, I wasn't expecting... Dude, what the hell is that? <laughs> Genuinely, I don't understand what is wrong with my roommates and the noises that they make. Uh, I want to say... I don't know. I, I lost. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Just... What are these... What are these soundboard sounds? Anywho, yeah, uh, Ravens crushing the Bills here. Josh Allen goes 16 of 29 for 180 yards. James Cook, 9 carries for 39 yards only. And then finally, Khalil Shakur, 4 catches for 62 yards. You've got Lamar Jackson going 13 of 18 for 156 yards and 2 touchdowns. Derek Henry, monster game. 24 carries, 199 yards, one touchdown, and then Justice Hill, six catches, 78 yards, and a touchdown uh, for the Bills. Big stat here of the day is going to be the three of 13 on third down. Uh, this Ravens defense challenged Baltimore in a way that they have not been challenged thus far. Uh, by far their lowest third down percentage going to be something that they need to pay attention to. Obviously, your offense wasn't working all that well, um, just as a whole. And, yeah, I had long, long term. It was crazy to see... Sorry, my stomach growling a little bit again. It was crazy to see Josh Allen beat the odds and make this team look good, like the roster was complete, but really, it's... it's lacking in the wide receiver department. And I think it is showing how much that they lost in the offseason now that they got matched up against uh, the Ravens. I mean, it's not that Miami was even that bad. They did a great job against Miami, but completely taken apart by this Ravens team here. So a lot to learn in this matchup for the Bills. And then for the Ravens, second straight week, rushing for over 270 yards. Uh, you are doing things right. You're absolutely doing things right. 270. I didn't think that they were going to be able to match that number, but they got it again. So keep doing what you're doing. That is truly very, very impressive. Uh, hats off to you guys. Back to 2-2 two two after a rough start. Next up, we move into the first of the two Monday night games, this being a matchup between the Titans and the Dolphins. Uh, the Titans actually getting a big victory here, another one that I was able to call, luckily. Uh, Titans winning 31-12 over the Dolphins. In this game, we have Mason Rudolph uh, leading the Titans 9 of 17 passing, 85 yards. Then we've got Tony Pollard with 22 carries for 88 yards and a score. And then finally, DeAndre Hopkins, two catches for 31 yards. Uh, then on the Dolphins side of things, we have Tyler Huntley, 14 of 22 passing for 96 yards. Then Tyler Huntley, eight carries for 40 yards and a touchdown. And then Jalen Waddle, four catches for 36 yards. Uh, big takeaway here for the Titans. Will Levis went down, uh, not by injury, but they benched him. Know, he threw another pick and they benched his his boy uh, and I think it is for the better <laughs> a little bit I wasn't expecting him to necessarily make it through the whole year uh, he's just very turnover heavy and you can see what the Titans are capable of obviously I think they could have won this game with him on the bench anyway uh, playing the game anyways but glad to see that they benched him I don't think that you have to roll out with Mason Rudolph I think it's good to show that Will Levis can be benched, but put him back out there, I think it's fine. But you don't want Mason Rudolph really playing games, like, continue to train Will Levis, but good discipline. And then for the Dolphins, bro, this is the worst team in football now. Uh, 96. What's the key stat? What's the key stat? Yeah, 96 yards of offense, 78 yards passing. If you include the sack yardage you lost, that is not good. You need a quarterback desperately. Like, this team is looking so bad after 2-0 went down. Uh, absolutely need some D 
decent quarterback play to keep you guys afloat. Even if you, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. It's just Tyler Huntley, Skylar Thompson, these guys are not cutting it. You need, like, a real quarterback now. And finally, we get to our last game of this week four slate. This was a, you know, loaded game between the Seahawks and the Lions, combining for over 70 points. Got the Lions finally walking away with victory, 42-29 to in this one. It was just touchdown after touchdown after touchdown for the Lions. Uh, on the Seahawks side of things, you've got Juno Smith, 38 of 56, for 395 yards passing. One touchdown, one interception. Kenneth Walker, the third, returns from injury, and uh, three touchdown day for him. 12 carries, 80 yards, three tutties. And then finally, DK Metcalf with seven catches for 104 yards. Jared Goff has a perfect day. 18 of 18 of passing, 292 yards, two touchdowns, and he got a touchdown pass. Oh, magnificent. One of the best QB stat lines you'll ever see. Jameer Gibbs, 14 carries for 78 yards and two touchdowns. And then finally, Jamison Williams, two catches, 80 yards and one touchdown. If you got to see the 70 yard touchdown that he brought in, it was uh, pretty cool to see him sprint down that sideline. Uh, and yeah, in this one, key takeaway for the Seahawks is going to be 516 yards of offense. That is huge. I'm not going to discredit that in any way. 516. That is enormous. Uh, very well done. Reason why you possibly lost this game, I will say is because you lost the turnover battle 2-0. to zero. That is not helpful in your cause. Uh, and then for Detroit, as great of a day as this was, like, so many touchdowns, 6 touchdown drives. It could have been an even better day if you were a little more, you know, disciplined. Lions, 12 penalties for 101 yards. I'm not going to let that go by uh, unnoticed. You guys do need to work on the penalties, but absolutely crazy what the ceiling is. Imagine it. If they take out six of those penalties, they, they have a whole other drive right there. Considering you get the ball at the 30, like that's at least three more points, possibly seven more points. Lions popping off big in this one. They climbed to three and one. Seahawks fall to three and one. Both, uh, actually no. Vikings at the top of the NFC North. Seahawks still at the top of the NFC West. So with that, we have our full recap covered uh, of our week four slate. In this week, I went eight and eight. Not ideal, but I will take it. I'll absolutely take it. Was not looking good after Sunday morning. I had a lot of very close games just not go my way. Uh, when you have the failed comeback attempt by the Bears, you have the failed comeback attempt by the Steelers. Uh, you know, sorry, not by the Bears, but the Rams. The Rams, not that close. Obviously a bad comeback attempt. The Steelers were really close, and I felt bad about that. Uh, they weren't that far off. Missed field goal by Greg Zerlion. That would have been one there. And then you had Young Kwe Koo. Uh, if there was no pass interference, that one would have been also going my way. So we take, let's say, even just three of these games, flip them in my favor. I go 11 and 5. I would have been ecstatic. But unfortunately, not the reality we live in. Uh, and with that, we have concluded week four. We can move into the week five waiver wire. Alrighty. So now we move into the week five waiver wire segment of this video. First up, we're going to be talking about quarterbacks. In the quarterback segment, we have three recommendations in all of them. Actually, in all of these position groups, I've got three recommendations for you. First up, it's going to be Justin Fields himself. I actually didn't expect him to be available in leagues the way that he was, but he's only on in 34% of leagues right now. and. Uh, pretty sure he just finished as the QB1 on the week. Uh, you know about his rushing upside, the fact that he can scramble, get yards. He was a very good rusher back in Chicago. 
that is all well known, but the fact that he threw for 300 yards passing, I think is the most uh, impressive part of his game against the Colts. So uh, that, coupled with the fact that he has three rushing touchdowns in the last two weeks, I would, you know, venture out going to get him. Depends if you're looking for a streaming quarterback. I don't know about his long-term job security. The Steelers are not committal about his role once Russell Wilson is back in the picture and healthy, so I don't love him long-term, but I do think that he has a good matchup this week against the uh, Cowboys, who have been giving up the third most fantasy points to opposing quarterbacks, and you know, if you're looking for a block and play, he could be a solid pick. Next up, we've got Sam Darnold, uh, Sam Darnold, early, you know, lead, lead, uh, lead leader in passing touchdowns, is only picked up in 44% of leagues as it stands, playing absolutely lights out, has put up nearly 20 points in his last three outings, and he is the quarterback five on the year as we talk about it today. So if he's available in your league, maybe go out and get him because it doesn't look like he is slowing down. He is actually a very viable quarterback in this league. <laughs> Weird. Anyway, last up, we have Geno Smith. I've been pushing Geno Smith since the draft. Uh, he was also on week one waiver wire, but the guy is, is going to be on here consistently because He's just not on, uh, averaging 337 yards passing over the last three weeks. He's the quarterback eight this year, despite only have, having four touchdowns and four picks. So his touchdown to interception ratio is at a flat one right now. And yet still, he is the quarterback eight on the year. That is crazy. Like, you should go at him, go out and get him before his first multi-touchdown game. Because that has to be on the horizon with JSN and with... Uh, DK and with Lockett, all these talented receivers, there's no way it doesn't happen. Okay, after that, we move into the running back. First running back that I'm going to recommend to you is going to be Kareem Hunt of the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, he led the Chiefs backfield in snaps in week four. The Chiefs, after the Rishi Rice injury, I think that they're going to need more playmakers that they can trust uh, with the ball on offense. Obviously, Travis Kelsey is stepping up a bit after Rasheed Rice went out, but they are going to lean maybe on Kareem Hunt, knowing what his talent and expertise is. He did have a very nice couple seasons with the Chiefs back when he was employed earlier in his career here, so we know that he can be very successful in the Andy, uh, and Andy Reid system. Uh, along with that, he is currently involved in both the rushing and receiving game, and he's only owned in 22% of leagues. So he has like truly starting quarterback, sorry, starting running back material. Go and get him. He is number one priority in the running back department. Number two, uh, we're going to talk about Antonio Gibson of the New England Patriots. Right now, his backfield snaps is floating around. 35% for the last two weeks, which is viable backup material, or not backup, but like second RB on a team. Uh, I do think that we might see more work for Gibson going forward, considering that Ramondre Stevenson has now fumbled in back-to-back -back weeks. Uh, his ball security is not looking ideal. And, you know, Jerry on top, we have Gibson being the leading receiver for the Patriots this past weekend. So, Gibson is right now only owned in 29% of leagues, and the Patriots have a very easy matchup this week against the Dolphins, which look to be one of the worst teams in the league, so it might be a run-heavy game script for them, and Gibson could see even more work. Finally, our third running back on this list is going to be Emmanuel Wilson of the Green Bay Packers. Uh, in the last two weeks, we have Emmanuel Wilson getting 22 touches to the 28 of Josh Jacobs. That is a decent amount of workload. Uh, not something that we want to overlook. Uh, anywho, after, along with that, he has played 40% of snaps over the last two weeks as well. Uh, even more so than Antonio Gibson. 40% is definitely like a lot. Like it's giving enough, like almost enough 
that you would start to consider he adds a standalone value uh, just for frame of reference. I'm not comparing the players or the situation, but David Montgomery this week was in on 40% of plays. So just to give you an idea of what 40% snap share is, that is big. Uh, and then I, I do think that his value is more so as a handcuff or a backup. He is carving more of a role. He's seeing more time in the backfield. Obviously, not a positive game script for the Packers in this one. They were down the entire game. They're not going to be running the ball. And yes, Josh Jacobs is a much better back. They're going to lean on him more heavily, but Emmanuel Wilson getting a decent amount of work, even if we're, Josh Jacobs were to miss time, I think Wilson gets a huge boost. So. Uh, if you're in a deeper league, or if you have just extra space, maybe stash him. Finally, uh, after that, we can move into the wide receivers of the week. Number one, let's talk about Wandell Robinson. I don't know why Wandell Robinson is still available in leagues, if I'm being honest. He had 14 targets in week four. That makes the most that he's seen this year. Overall, in 2024, Wondell Robinson is number four in targets amongst all wide receivers. That is all your big names. He has more than them, basically. Uh, like Tyreek Hill, like Justin Jefferson, all these big name guys. Wondell Robinson is blowing them out of the water. It is insane. Uh, the fact that he is doing this and the fact that he's only owned in 27% of leagues. Just had a big week. Uh, if you didn't get him in the earlier week or after week one, he has had very serviceable fantasy outings, uh, averaging like 13 points a week in PPR. His worst week was still 9.8 points. Definitely grab him. I know, I know it's not an enticing New York Giants offense, but we cannot argue with what we are seeing. He is getting the ball so often. After that, we've got Don Davion Wicks of the Green Bay Packers. Wick saw 13 targets this week, which was tied for third amongst all wide receivers. He also leads all Packers wide receivers in red zone targets this year, which is pretty significant. Uh, we also have the opportunity to see him more in this offense as long as Christian Watson is out. So, a uh, decently big day this past week. Jordan Love is back. I think that's huge as well. So, go out and grab Wicks. He's only owned in 10% of the leagues might be valuable for you. Finally, we've got Trey Ducker of the Las Vegas Raiders. Over the last two weeks, he's got 15 targets, 12 catches, 137 yards, and two touchdowns. But that is to be taken with a grain of salt. Devontae Adams was out, so he is doing this uh, as like the wide receiver two on the team. Poor matchup this week against the Broncos, but the Raiders have just informed teams that they will be considering dealing Devontae Adams for a second uh, second round pick and maybe some other compensation. I don't know if that is too high of a price point for teams to pay, but this is according to Adam Schefter, and he is a very reliable source. So if Devontae Adams is to, fit, to be dealt, then you've got uh, you know, a hidden gem on your hands with Trey Tucker. So, might be worth an addition. Next up, let's move into the most dire skill group in fantasy football, the tight end position. Uh, you can need all the help you can get with the tight end play this year. First up, Tucker Kraft of the Green Bay Packers. He had nine targets this week, which is tied for first amongst all tight ends, tying with Travis Kelsey. Next up, his two red zone targets this week bring him to a total of four on the year. That is tied for first among all tight ends, uh, tied with Cole Kmet and Colby Parkinson. Obviously not a large number, uh, considering he don't it this week, but the fact that he's getting red zone targets and literally no other tight end in the league is worth an addition. And once again, Jordan Love is back, and he has proved that he is ready to sling the ball. I am more likely to trend positively trend upwards of these Packers receivers and tight ends. I think it's a good idea to go get them. Next up, Cade Otten, tight end for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He has 17 targets in the last two weeks and 13 catches. Over that span, the only guys that have more targets are Jake Ferguson and Dallas Goddard. 
So, Kato and being a ball magnet, seeing that this Buccaneers offense is ruling, they're getting a lot of offensive production in all weeks, except for the one against the Broncos, really. Uh, I think that they've got a pretty air raid offense. Baker Mayfield seems like he's been slinging it in quite a few weeks here. Uh, I would go out and get him. I think that he is the main guy. He's going to see them field more so than the wide receiver three on that offense. With, like, if that's like Jalen McMillan. So, uh, worthy addition. And then finally, you've got Tyler Conklin, tight end of the New York Jets. He had a breakout game last week against the Patriots. Put up a decent stat line there. And then this week, had to see how he bounces back. If it was just a one-week fluke or what's going on. But, uh, promising usage. He saw the field a lot. He is actually only behind Gary Wilson in terms of snap count. And this past week, he was tied for most targets on the team with eight, uh, tying both Lazard and Wilson. So it seems like Aaron Rodgers finally has some trust in his tight end. Uh, and considering how dire this tight end position is, he's only owned in 35% of leagues. Might be worth an addition. Uh, if you like Aaron Rodgers as a passer. Uh, by the way, Kate Auden owned in 6.2% of leagues, and Tucker Craft owned in 5% of leagues. Uh, lastly, let's talk about defenses, st defensive streaming that you can do uh, this week if you are not someone that has a consistent week-in, week-out defense. Number one, we've got the New England Patriots. I'm going to be honest, the Patriots defense has not been good in the last three weeks, but their opponents have been great. They played Seattle, then they played New York, and then they played San Francisco. So I think we can give them a pass here. This week, they play against Miami. In Miami, unless they go out and pull out a quarterback out of thin air, they are the worst team. <laughs> like, uh, can't even pass for 100 yards. You saw how they made Tennessee look. And if the Tennessee Titans defense can get that many points, surely the Patriots defense can get some points out of them this week. Uh, they're on in 2% of the leagues. Please go get them. Next up, the Denver Broncos. The Denver Broncos have absolutely destroyed the Buccaneers and the Jets in back-to-back -back weeks on the defensive side of the ball, uh, limiting both offenses to 9 points. They're currently the number 2 defense in all of fantasy. And they're going to be playing the Raiders this week. So, go get them. <laughs> go get them by all means. Like, get the Broncos defense if they're available. And they probably will be because they're only owned in 6% of leagues. Finally, we've got the Washington Commanders defense. Everyone is talking about the Commanders offense, rightfully so. But the Commanders this week are going to be playing against the Cleveland Browns. The Cleveland Browns are yet to score more than 18 points in any week this year. On top of that, the Commanders defense last week had four sacks on the Arizona Cardinals, and the Browns have given up the most sacks of any team this year with 19. So, as it stands, the Commanders are only owned in 2% of leagues. I would highly suggest if you're looking for an extreme plug-and-play, uh, like really, if the Patriots and Broncos are gone, you should be able to rely on the Commanders defense being available and that being viable in just this match. So, there you have it. We have completed uh, not only the Week 4 recap, but also the Week 5 waiver wire. Uh, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed content like this, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. I'll be putting out more videos as the weeks progress. Obviously, I was going to try and get a video on Sunday, but it could not work with the audio sync issue. I, I'm truly apologetic about that. I, I'm trying to stay consistent with the schedule. I uh, have not been doing the fantasy videos as much. I think that they're on the shopping block just because uh, week one they didn't see as much success. So I'm hoping that this upcoming week, maybe I tinker around with the schedule a little bit, try and move some things around, so that, I don't know, I, I'm gonna see, I'm gonna see what I can do, but thank you all for sticking with me, and sticking through the rough patches, which has been trying to figure out the, the scheduling content for the school year, but yeah, as always, thank you for watching, uh, and I will see you